and uh, for the okay. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. I will share my screen right now. And screen two. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. All good. So, uh, well. Uh, I will be talking mostly about, uh, of course, uh, spaces for orbital stations and uh, designing habitable spaces in orbit, which is uh, uh, with specific gravity conditions. But um, uh, I will start with a few things uh, that are important uh, aspects of uh, space architecture, no matter what you design uh, your habitats for or your uh, space structures for. Uh, so, okay, yeah. Uh, so again, talking about uh, human spaceflight, uh, you probably know, but I will still repeat it. So there are many design and planning challenges that uh, architects and engineers and uh, scientists have to deal and understand and address this, uh, to the best of our knowledge. So first of all, we need to bring everything from Earth uh, to space, and that means that we have uh, great launch mass and volume constraints, which depends on what uh, type of launch system uh, we use and what uh, capabilities we have on Earth. So that uh, limits uh, the size of the structures that uh, we can bring to space. Uh, we need to design uh, uh, to fight and to address all the deep space flight hazards. Uh, and of course, first of all, it's radiation. Or maybe secondary is radiation, but first it's all pressure, pressurized structures. So we, the vacuum is the, uh, one of the biggest challenges. Then we have to protect the crew and equipment from radiation, extreme temperature, sw uh, temperature swings, and the microgravity, zero gravity conditions that's uh, in orbit or in flight. Uh, well, crew has to be protected, uh, and we need to design to support. Uh, all uh, human factors is associated with these different gravity conditions and uh, constraints that we have in um, uh, in space habitats. And that also leads to all these issues associated uh, health issues with psychological, social, and cultural problems uh, that are uh, very common uh, for uh, being for humans being for long term or even short term in isolation and confined environments. Uh, <clears throat> it's not only in space, but also uh, on Earth uh, when we're talking about extreme environments and uh, polar stations, let's say or underwater uh, stations or habitats. Uh, well, uh, now these uh, space habitat requirements uh, that again applies to any gravity conditions. Uh, we need to think about uh, power supply, life support, uh, medical support, and it depends on the mission, how much we can afford, how much medical support we can provide. Uh, robotic capabilities is always the must. We always have to have uh, certain robotic capabilities also depends on the mission on the mission planning, mission goals. Uh, we need to think about maintenance and repairment um, and what we can bring with us, uh, what, what we can store uh, inside, inside the habitat to support all these functions. And uh, also uh, equipment for any in-flight operations, which means if we need to uh, do, or the crew will have to do uh, EVAs, extravehicular activities, so that has to be provided, support for extra uh, vehicular activities has to be provided. And obviously we want the crew safely back. Uh, so it means uh, we need to think about returning capabilities. Well, uh, again, first of all, all structures, uh, pressurized structures when we design it uh, for humans, it means uh, uh, the structure has to contain uh, enough uh, normal pressure, not normal atmospheric pressure. Uh, for humans to operate. Uh, that means that uh, we are limited somehow uh, in geometries that we use. So circular uh, uh, geometries cross section uh, is required or is the best uh, the geometry that uh, it's um, all this uh, 
uh, all the physics that associated with uh, distri pressure distribu distribution inside uh, your structure. Uh, <clears throat> so that uh, minimizes the weight and the uh, of the structure. We can um, have um, we can uh, provide uh, more than uh, with one uh, launch uh, to launch into space. If we have we have minimized the size, but also minimize the mass. <clears throat> so uh, again, very quickly about uh, four major domains of space architecture for uh, any structures in space or on the moon or Mars or anywhere of Earth. First, we're talking about primary structures and environmental control and life support systems, so it was uh, interior secondary structures and uh, utilities that are not related to ICLIS uh, systems. Uh, so primary structure is something that uh, on Earth we would refer as the building envelope that separates uh, our environment where humans are living and operating, operating from the uh, external environment. Uh, it uh, includes several parts of it, so several systems. As thermal micrometeoroid protection, it has to provide, uh, like uh, on Earth, we always have in the wall uh, insulation uh, materials, insulation layers in the wall. Then hatches, or like on Earth, it would be doors, viewports, or windows, uh, docking ports, or entrances, and active uh, any active structures such as uh, radiators uh, to reject uh, extra, uh, extra heat from the habitat or uh, solar uh, panels or louvers or shading devices, anything like that. So here's uh, on, this, um, on the pictures, you will see uh, the blanket insulation, multi-layer insulation blanket is on the top uh, of on the, what's one, um, on the top of the structure, the part of primary structure of this uh, permanent multipurpose module or PPM. And uh, on the right is a Boeing um, is a CST 100. Also, you can see this uh, primary structure, um, how it looks without the external, the final uh, layer of um, uh, being covered, uh, cover, covering this, um, the capsule. Um, here is uh, uh, other elements, as I said, hatches, and on the left you will see the hatches that separate module from module. Uh, viewports, uh, examples, uh, they usually small, uh, uh, unless it's a cupola, which is provides uh, 360 view. That is a special, of course, case. And uh, if we're talking about future uh, tourists uh, going to, um, in in space and enjoying the view so definitely viewports will have to be larger and uh, will have to provide uh, more viewing capabilities than uh, this small uh, viewport like that the reason why it's small is also because we put it in a pressure vessel and um, uh, the smaller is uh, the uh, the safer version of it and of course uh, uh, then it requires less uh, uh, structure around it or bulkhead structure, so it's also uh, weighs le uh, less than it would be if it was a large scale uh, window. And uh, docking mechanism is on the right, uh, uh, showing us it's all bursting ports. Uh, those are the entrances uh, as um, two modules from um, outside uh, of the vehicle between two different ve vehicles, spacecraft. And uh, here's an example of active structures uh, as on uh, the ISS. Uh, where you place them, how they will be located uh, is very important uh, because uh, we need to make sure that all the visiting vehicles can dock and undock safely. Uh, so it won't be, they won't be on the way. Also, we don't want, uh, especially with solar arrays, we don't want them to be shaded, obviously, because we want uh, to them to provide maximum of uh, uh, the electrical energy that needed uh, for the station. 
So um, there are many constraints associated with that. And that's why they also uh, consider it as uh, part of the primary structure elements. Well, environmental control and life support systems obviously as critical for human space life. Uh, we need to uh, provide air uh, and uh, um, water recycling uh, or um, purification for the crew, uh, water collections, uh, water filtering, air filtering, um, air distribution through the, uh, through the whole uh, spacecraft habitat or through all the elements of the habitat. Uh, we need uh, to think about how much power all of the systems require, and it's quite a lot of power, uh, and uh, what kind of redundancy can be provided for that. So those um, are very important uh, parts. Uh, here is uh, the examples how they are, this uh, Eclis, Eclis systems uh, racks uh, look on the ISS. Those are, these is photos are taken. Uh, from Johnson Space Center, uh, but it's exactly the same uh, racks are uh, the same composition of racks are on the ISS right now. And of course, uh, toilet is critical element. And uh, we definitely, if we design an um, orbital uh, space station or orbital module uh, or in flight uh, going to Mars, Moon, or elsewhere, so it has to be more than one toilet. That's important because if it's broken, so that's a critical element. Well, all of them are pretty critical. So redundancy for those systems is very important and maintenance uh, capabilities are very important. For interior secondary structure or secondary structures, we think about and consider all standoffs and mounting brackets uh, for to mount equipment inside the habitat or any pressurized module. Uh, all the equipment packaging schemes, how they, uh, again, racks that they showed you where these Eclipse systems are located. So those are secondary structures or interior structures. All the, everything that we need to uh, provide to mount all these other elements like lighting or ducts or some stuff like that. Uh, and here is some example. So on the left, uh, Dan Burban uh, is exercising. So uh, all this mount for the exercising equipment is also considered a secondary structure element or interior. And then Dan Petit is uh, in the Vista service module here. You can see all this stuff, uh, all this stuff around him mounted uh, on the walls. So all these mounts are also considered uh, being uh, secondary structures. Also anything that is needed for mobility inside uh, this uh, uh, habitat or lab or any pressurized um, module where humans are, need to think about how we can um, provide uh, mobility capabilities. It means that you can fix yourself in place or you push yourself from somewhere and, and uh, so you can move around easily. Um, and uh, utilities or so non-eclipse uh, systems that include uh, uh, lighting uh, or avionics, anything that needed for communication, collection of non-eclipse related gases, uh, for example, uh, CO2 capturing uh, machines or some other gases, uh, all power supplies and distribution, uh, data collection, and um, and so on. Uh, here is uh, examples how it looks at night on the ISS uh, with emergency lighting systems um, uh, lit up uh, when the crew is sleeping and this uh, individual uh, lighting system that uh, uh, is provided for the crew in their uh, crew quarters and can be moved around as needed. Well, with uh, pressurized structures, uh, we, uh, they can be hard shell or inflatables. Uh, with hard shell modules, they are uh, similar to the ISS. And here is a picture from the museum uh, in uh, Korolev in Moscow, in suburbs of Moscow. Uh, is Energia, um, Energia Museum. And here, as you see, Apollo uh, capsule mock-up uh, and connected with Soyuz. It's uh, those both mock-ups were used uh, when Apollo Soyuz program was um, 
uh, initiated and uh, both astronauts and cosmonauts were training for it in uh, 1970s. So those are also hard shell modules uh, and um, all those utility racks and everything how I was showing you before, uh, those uh, um, parts and how it's used uh, in hard shell modules that are on the ISS. Well, now we always want to provide more room and think how we can uh, really make uh, life uh, uh, in orbit for astronauts and uh, cosmonauts better and uh, uh, how can we offer them uh, better accommodations uh, and uh, better, more comfortable spaces for them to live and work eff uh, efficiently. So inflatable, uh, inflatable modules, of course, uh, uh, is uh, one of the options. And now when beam module, inflatable module of Bigelow Aerospace was tested uh, in orbit and uh, proved that uh, those structures uh, can be used and can provide a habitable environment. Uh, nobody lived in that in BEAM, but uh, it was uh, um, all the sensors for uh, pressure, atmospheric composition, and so on, temperature. So showed that uh, that inflatable structure is uh, good uh, and uh, can be used uh, as, um, uh, for living and for working uh, in space. So here are some examples how um, uh, uh, systems and, uh, can be installed and uh, how the combined uh, of, uh, benefits of hard shell module uh, with pre-integrated systems and racks in it can be combined with inflatable where uh, inflatable has to be uh, first of course uh, deployed, inflated, and then uh, all these systems have to be brought inside and uh, installed and deployed later on. So here's another example how those systems, uh, interior elements, secondary uh, structures can be installed inside the inflatable module. Uh, well, uh, I know it's uh, the uh, this lecture or this uh, discussion is about microgravity conditions, orbital. Uh, conditions, but here is uh, something for you to consider how it is uh, different or maybe different and what aspects of uh, design uh, may be different uh, in different gravity conditions. Uh, I added here artificial gravity as one of these um, conditions because it's very different uh, how systems will be designed, how humans will feel and therefore how we will uh, have to design all these elements, uh, interiors, arrange interiors, and how co even connect elements, not only interiors, but overall spacecraft, if artificial gravity is in place. Uh, and uh, artificial gravity can be considered as a countermeasure for microgravity conditions for all those hardships that uh, humans uh, will be dealing with as uh, bone loss, um, then the mass, uh, muscle loss, then all this uh, fluid shift uh, in the upper body, also visual um, uh, problems uh, that some of uh, space travelers experienced after long duration um, flight uh, in orbit. Uh, so all of that um, may be a lesson if we uh, provide artificial gravity as a countermeasure. But that comes with big, um, uh, big problems uh, related to engineering systems and related to human systems as uh, as a, that um, of human um, capabilities that will be restricted uh, because of uh, in conditions in rotating environments. These Coriolis uh, forces affecting our inner ear and all of that. So that needs to be investigated still. So yes, back into microgravity again, uh, need to think about uh, how uh, humans will be moving through the habitat or the system of habitats modules. Uh, so it's easy, it's, you can float, but you have to fix yourself in place. You have to uh, fix other things in place. 
uh, and uh, including you know, when you're sleeping, you need to consider how a person will be sleeping, how the crew quarters can be organized. Uh, very important to provide visual cues uh, to uh, navigate uh, inside this uh, space station, especially if there are several elements are connected. Uh, there is no up and down, obviously. Usually people refer to their feet as down uh, in uh, zero gravity conditions. But uh, uh, again, up and down can be different for diff in different orientation uh, inside the habitat. So uh, indicating where you are, in, where you are uh, what side of this uh, habitat you are, with where things are, how you organize an interior that is very clear. If it doesn't matter in what direction your head is, but you should be uh, very uh, confident uh, where you're going and uh, uh, what you need to, to do to get to the point uh, where you want to go. Uh, again, uh, physical adaptation, as I said, is loss of muscle, uh, bone density and body fluids. Uh, uh, produce shift, uh, produce deconditioning, multi-level deconditioning, uh, psychological issues also associated to that, uh, physical um, problems, uh, engineering design challenges are associated with zero gravity uh, influencing uh, how fluid systems work, uh, how stuff grows, um, so we need to provide airflow. We need to uh, think about uh, the water distributions and how that will be working with systems allocated, how much power again you will need for that. And of course, housekeeping is very uh, complicated because whatever is loose is lo lost there and eventually ends up at the air filter on the station, but uh, you don't uh, want to uh, clog it uh, so, the sooner than uh, it has to be replaced. Uh, so thinking about how to um, you secure things in place, uh, what kind of materials you use that they don't produce uh, of gassing and uh, they don't produce any fuzz or anything that uh, will clog uh, your air filters or uh, your uh, life support system. Well, here's a few examples of uh, inflatable uh, modules um, design, interior design. So it, uh, on the left is the roidal structure that inflatable surrounds the hard, sh uh, hard shell core where all the system signs installed. And in the inflatable portion of it uh, was uh, installed in greenhouse. That's uh, where these uh, pallets with um, uh, plants are rotating uh, around um, around this uh, the inflatable, and uh, uh, also that stimulates uh, the produce uh, growth uh, significantly, apparently. Uh, but also, it's combination of benefits of both hard shell and inflatable. Uh, again, uh, gravity-related challenges, as I said before, integration of means to mitigate all the physical, uh, as a summary, uh, health hazards, uh, visual cues, systems and interfaces uh, where they are located and how everything is distributed so they uh, easy, uh, easily can be fixed and maintained as needed. Uh, thinking about how you zone uh, your uh, f uh, functions inside the habitat. I will show later uh, how this uh, adjacency matrix. So what functions can be next to each other? What that have to be separated? How you provide this zoning? Uh, how you provide uh, circulation inside the station is all important. Again, you never can... Uh, uh, provide too much of storage. So it's always uh, storage is important. And so you need to think about how much uh, uh, storage will be needed for all these systems to support all the systems. Again, uh, physical and psychological uh, issues and the conditioning, uh, again, they are related to each other. Here is the matrix. So it's uh, how we usually, what we usually use when uh, we start working on a project. 
So uh, thinking about uh, parts and functions of the habitat and considering what can be close, what have what systems and functions have to be close to each other, what uh, what uh, can be close, to each other, or that uh, uh, the ones that have to be really separated. For example, uh, the crew on the ISS was complaining and they didn't want uh, this exercising. Um, uh, area next to their dining or galley area because associated all the smell and all of that stuff. So things like that uh, have to be considered again, what is private, what is semi-private, what is uh, uh, open uh, or multi-functional areas. That's all important to understand. So uh, here is uh, another uh, way of looking at this, like how you provide value-based design. So again, looking at what is feasible, how much space you have, uh, and what other functions are required. So when you can combine it, also evaluate, um, uh, find uh, compromise, that's uh, the best uh, probably solution, even though there are uh, many uh, solutions uh, obviously can be considered, depends on your needs and depends on the mission. Uh, here are some examples of uh, uh, the habitat uh, floor plan. Uh, here is a system of the separation, so-called floor. In, in microgravity, it's not really a floor, it's just separation, separating um, uh, partition, let's say. Uh, this is modular, so some elements can be uh, taken out and provide additional uh, circulation flows if needed, or uh, they can be installed uh, again so to uh, create a, a separation on functions. Um, and that's how it would look uh, as an interior, so you can either separate and you have some medical area uh, over there in the lab. Here is another uh, lab uh, working on different types of research. It can be also modified, those partitions are taken away. It can be modified uh, for different functions, uh, for example, uh, exercising fun uh, inside the habitat. So that's uh, uh, different ways of everything is modular and everything is replaceable. Here's a few examples of our uh, projects did this Almaz uh, station uh, for Escalibur Almaz company and uh, they had a shell of old salute uh, Russian or Soviet salute station and wanted to use it for uh, commercial purposes uh, for two weeks of uh, tourist mission and then it can uh, be swept very uh, easily and fast to serve different type of commercial activity, for example, commercial research. So that was a big challenge because this station is very, very small and put all these functions in it was a difficult, uh, difficult task. So we decided to um, separate it and keep all the equipment for uh, both functions uh, of the station uh, in one in the smaller portion of this, uh, of this station and uh, the larger diameter part of the station would be used for living and uh, research accommodations. Here are some examples. Uh, so it's uh, during the research, how it can be arranged. We also, of course, suggested to install in a larger viewport than they had on uh, Salute Station. And uh, some of the examples. So we looked at uh, three stages of development. So first it would be uh, just a station with this uh, Almas capsule, it's return capsule. Um, then uh, second return capsule can be launched and installed and that will uh, allow, uh, that will allow to ac accommodate more people because we can only have that many people on the station that how much, uh, how many seats we have in our return uh, vehicle. So if uh, it is two, only two, like it was in almost, it would be only two. If it's four, then it's four. And then this, uh, we suggested uh, adding an inflatable portion of it, similar to the beam module, like uh, the ones in, on the ISS right now to expand on this um, 
uh, commercial activities for tourists. Here is an example of artificial gravity, rotating environment. Uh, again, uh, everything is arranged around the core. And uh, on one side, we have uh, habitats, uh, habitation modules, and uh, in the counterweight uh, is uh, repairs and storage modules on the other side. So everything is assembled together. Then once it's uh, in flight, uh, those uh, modules are expanded from the core on tethers and uh, the core starts rotating and providing these uh, artificial gravity conditions. Here's another example that we did for uh, Boeing, uh, looked at uh, deployable airlock um, for orbital, um, for orbital um, uh, conditions and for orbital uh, uh, destinations. So looked at a thin wall inflatable uh, with uh, external uh, hatch uh, inflatable with high pressure structural elements added. And then just uh, with uh, only one hatch uh, inflatable airlock that would open as a bucket. Uh, so it would have a hinge on one side and opens as a bucket on the other side. So did the study looked at um, uh, different um, ways how uh, astronauts uh, would be uh, suited inside those habitats. So of course, we looked at the minimalistic as small environment as possible for airlock. Um, that was quite interesting. Here is again at the end, uh, and oh, I am a little bit over time, but uh, here is just at the end, I wanted to show you what is uh, proposed right now. Uh, you, if you are not aware, or maybe you're aware that Axiom Space uh, it was selected as the first commercial uh, station, uh, and uh, they're working very hard here in Houston and expanding quite a lot. Quite few of our students, uh, or graduates, I should say, uh, working there, and the company grows uh, very fast. So here is an example of the proposal what they have. Uh, for the interior, for tourists, uh, and um, uh, for orbital activities. Uh, I would be interested to hear what you think about it, if you, um, if you wish. Uh, then, of course, uh, later, three other companies uh, were, or three other groups of companies, three proposals, uh, say, uh, were selected by NASA. And it includes uh, Blue Origin of Kent, uh, that is uh, uh, also includes on the team, uh, is um, uh, it's called Orbital Reef, uh, basic conf configuration over here. So the, their team includes uh, Genesis and Boeing, and uh, probably somebody else that I don't remember, but this definitely three are on uh, Blue Origin's teams. Here is another NanoRex and Lockheed Martin proposal in the uh, in the middle, and uh, a Northrop uh, Grumman Systems Corporation. Uh, their proposal is uh, on on the right. Uh, I am open for your questions. Uh, please uh, ask me questions. I will be happy to answer. Do you have any questions? I did have a question. So, you mm -hmm. you were talking about different aspects, and one of the things was the psychological adaptation uh, aspect. And you were talking about the uh, the need for defining the flow and the route, right? Psychologically, mm -hmm. that's important for people to understand space. Um, and <clears throat> so, one question in 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 one of your slides. Uh, uh, that you showed where you have this large window uh, that showed space there there was a but in that image we didn't see a flow and a roof separating so were you thinking of something else uh, for that particular uh, what separating so what we didn't see uh -huh. uh, so the, the question is really uh, are there any criteria like in space? You, you you obviously don't know where the ground is and where the uh, roof is. So, mm -hmm. how, is there a criteria to define where you would put the flow and where you would put the roof? Ah, the floor is uh, that where to put yes. the floor? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I don't have this 
uh, I do have, uh, let me share again. Uh, and uh, share. Um, okay, so that example when I was showing Windows, um, uh, it really doesn't matter. There is no uh, floor or there is no ceiling because everything is uh, 360 around you. Everything is available, right? Right. Uh, and uh, so, for example, even that uh, any small room that uh, on Earth that would feel like really small, it, it will feel bigger uh, in uh, zero gravity condition. Uh, so, uh, windows okay here so uh yeah so uh it, it will feel bigger because you can uh, really reach to any surface it just depends on your position so here on this uh, image uh, from this uh, mirror mock-up you don't see the floor but mirror station was designed with that idea of the, the it was a floor it was a ceiling different colors used for ceiling and the floor and the walls. Uh, so, right, it's really was uh, uh, very terrestrial oriented, let's say, uh, design. And it was done uh, for a reason, because uh, uh, the idea was that uh, uh, cosmonauts would be missing this kind of feeling. So it, it's, it's better for us, for humans, to have this reference. In reality, it turned out, no. So it doesn't really matter. What matters is how things are arranged. And astronauts are also saying that uh, actually bigger is not always better. What is really better is the way how is uh, everything is organized inside that environment. How comfortable, convenient, and clear how it's uh, also uh, adaptable to their needs. Because no matter how we design and how we, we all like we do it on to, to the best of our knowledge, obviously we want to satisfy their needs. We want them to be happy in our environment, but uh, uh, it may be very different how they will figure it out uh, in orbit or in flight. And they, they, they will know in situ what works better, what is not, right? So to give that flexibility is very important. Um, so, uh, well, I don't know, I, I think, uh, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, the, so my question was like, if, right? So if we define uh, a flow and a roof or a ceiling for a space station, would there be any criteria of where or which plane you, you would use to define the the, the flow and the sea? Like, is it is it towards like let's say directly towards the the Earth would be considered the the flow? Is there some sort of a, a reference? No, no, no uh, I no, uh, I never uh, actually heard from any astronauts or cosmonauts that reference that they will refer. Uh, that's where the Earth is, is the floor. No, uh, it's very important uh, to consider where your viewport is because that's what you want to see if we're talking about low Earth orbit or any uh, Earth orbit, as like a matter of fact. Obviously, you want that is the most magnificent view. So yeah. that's what where you want your viewport to be. So obviously, it's kind of restricts it from the floor. Right. So it's more about, uh, yeah, that's so, so, but would, would that would that be the reference though? Like let's say uh, you, you want the viewport to direct towards Earth, right? So the direct, access, yeah. Yeah, the direct access from Earth would be the viewport. So then that would that would suggest where our flow and the roof should be, like perpendicularly. Yeah, yeah, but again, I I um, usually um, tell uh, my students to do not refer to the floor or the ceiling, okay. because again, in uh, zero g or micro g, it can confuse you because then you kind of go into the followed and uh, very terrestrial approach of the designing right. uh, thing, 
and uh, this thing is the size of your uh, habitat may be different, designed in different ways, but uh, uh, it's not necessarily where the floor is, it's something like that. So they all accessible equally. Okay. So that is, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, could you come forward? Uh, we have interior design and apparel design team both. So this is an apparel design team who has a question. So my question is that uh, what happens if someone spills some liquid inside the shuttle? What happened if someone was what? Uh, if if someone some spilled, liquid is spilling. Suppose someone is drinking water. Yeah. If someone is spinning. It's spilling, liquid is spilling. Coffee. Oh, okay, okay. It's, if something is spilled in the uh, in microgravity, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, uh, you know that uh, liquid uh, uh, tends to become a sphere, right? Yeah. If you drop something, because there is uh, again again pressure. Uh, yeah, so you have a suction device for that. Oh, I, I don't see you, but I, I think you show something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. so, is there any suction for that suction system? That well, was... yes, everything is, again, uh, there is no uh, convection, right? So there is, uh, it doesn't have, so everything, it, all that require, uh, applies to all fluids, air included. So uh, it's you really, it's really important to think how air will be circulating because where you, it's all about pumps, yeah, pushing air, sucking air. That's why I said like, no matter what you drop or you lose, everything ends up on the air filter at the end. Same thing with the liquid. Yeah, it's just will be bubbles. Yeah. I think you can even find multiple videos from the ISS where astronauts are playing with this, you know, they let it go on purpose and then they suck it, you know, floating up there. So um, uh, if you spill something, that's what will be happening. The thing is you don't want on the way how that spill will go to your air filter eventually. First of all, it will, you will have to clean the air filter. Secondly, mm -hmm. on the way, it can end up on some surfaces that you really don't want it to be, right? So. Yeah. You better don't spill <laughs> something. Yeah. Thank you. Then. Mm -hmm. you well, uh, Don Petit uh, they created this uh, cup. Well, he's a very creative guy. Uh, he always comes up with very interesting projects. He's very curious too. He, he does, uh, you can also find multiple videos of his experiments uh, on YouTube. Uh, one of those uh, was uh, to uh, design a cup for microgravity. And in fact, it was designed and uh, used uh, on the ISS because he wanted to drink his coffee out of a cup. And uh, you cannot do that, obviously, right? Uh, so how you design it in such a way that this fluid that again becomes a ball inside it uh, starts distributing, you can suck it in and drink it like it's this uh, normal drink, not without using, like they usually have all these pouches with straws, right? Mm -hmm. So that was interesting, uh, uh, interesting project. Any other questions for Dr. Lenora? I would like to ask a general question about apparel. Can you see me? No, no, no. Thank you. Oh, I would like, I, I'm the um, uh, instructor for the apparel design students. Is there anything that you can tell us about the clothing challenges of uh, dwellings of these cramped spaces, whether it's zero gravity, microgravity, or artificial gravity? Is there a distinction between those three as far as the clothing is concerned. Closing? You mean the closing? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, not, uh, not really. Uh, this, I, I would 
I wouldn't think so. Well, it's difference is how you would clean it probably because it's, again, systems uh, will work differently. Um, uh, right now on the ISS, a lot of it is just uh, they replace and uh, use new clothes and a lot of uh, stuff that they or like can be trashed or they don't use anymore uh, is burned in the, atmos in the atmosphere on re-entry. They send this. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in, I wouldn't think that this can be different uh, for artificial gravity and uh, micro zero gravity conditions, the closing, I mean. Uh, on the ISS, you probably noticed uh, that they don't wear shoes. Maybe in artificial gravity, you will have to wear shoes uh, and provide some better traction because you will be able to walk. But you walk in rotating environments, so it can be in funny way again it hasn't been done yet so we don't know but uh i just would i i would think that uh, providing extra traction uh for um for walking in artificially uh, induced gravity conditions in rotating environment would be important uh in microgravity you don't need shoes you need your legs you need your feet to uh, fix yourself in place. That's why in the ISS you see a lot of uh, railing and their handrails, or but they're not only for hands, but also for feet. Uh, they designed initially some special foot restraints, but turned out it's, you don't need to have anything so special. It's you just, just having a railing is good enough so you can slide your uh, feet under and secure yourself in, in place. Uh, usually everybody wears socks there. Uh, again, uh, with socks, uh, sometimes it can be slippery under the rail, so it's harder to grab the rail. Um, uh, I know that uh, it was an astronaut who didn't like socks. He wanted to be barefoot and he felt like it was easier for him to secure himself in place, which is true, of course, it's better traction. Uh, but uh, his uh, crew uh, members considered it it's not very nice uh, when you float around with your bare feet. So it's, uh, again, it's some cultural and uh, social thing kind of. Um, so uh, he had to wear socks as well. Uh, uh, other than that, uh, I don't think this uh, other close closing will be uh, probably the same in different gravity conditions. I, and uh, I don't think they have anything super special uh, for the ISS compared to terrestrial. So it's still t-shirts and uh, they have shorts and, or trousers and stuff like that. Something flexible <clears throat> is important. Uh, because again, you can stretch, you can secure yourself in place. Thank you. Okay. All right, Dr. Benoit, thank you so much for making time. I know it's a Saturday, so we really appreciate you taking time to speak to us and speak to the students about the different experiences that you have at your uh, space architecture program. So thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.